morning, everyone. On behalf of everyone in the FS Reg team at Burnus, Paul, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our to you to our next um, Horizon scanning session. It's hard to believe that our last um, biannual update was in January and so much has happened since then. But before we get into that, I'm just going to do the usual housekeeping. Um, please, can you keep your cameras off and keep yourself on mute? This is definitely not interactive because we don't have time. There's so much to get through. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to populate the chat box within the Zoom function. Um, if we've got time, depending on how quickly I speak, uh, and Jamie speaks as well, but although I often talk much faster than him, um, we will try to address your questions at the end. But if not, and if there's any burning questions you do have, you will get our contact details. So feel free to get in touch as if by magic they've appeared on the screen. So I'm absolutely delighted to speak to you today alongside my co-partner, Jamie. And um, for today's event, as usual, we're going to be detailing some of the significant updates that have taken place since our last session in January. And you have to bear with us. As I said, there's quite a lot to get through because, as usual, with anything in our sector, there has been lots of developments. As usual, in these events, given we've got such a diverse audience, um, so we try to cover a broad range of developments. And that not all of it might be relevant for your for you or the firm or, or the role that you've got within your, your firm. Um, however, I feel like the beauty of FS Reg is that even if the update is not relevant for you professionally, it can be of interest to you personally because we all have financial products. So hopefully, even if the parts that aren't necessarily relevant, you'll still find them useful and enjoyable. Um, and as usual, here's my caveat, here's the disclaimer, the small print. We haven't had time in this hour-long presentation to go over absolutely everything that's going on in this world and might be affecting your firm. So we've really just tried to pick out some of the most important or, or interesting um, items based on and who we know as is, is, is our audience today. So with that caveat, you should absolutely ensure that you do your own horizon scanning and you check your own internal log to make sure that you're aware of everything that's coming down the track that's going to affect you in the next year and that you've got the relevant um, project set up to implement any changes that are relevant. So working in the regulated space you'll know that one of the highlights of the year is the publication of the FCA's regulatory initiative spread and you may remember in January when we last spoke to you it had been delayed. Well um, if you're not familiar, usually the grid provides details of the timing of either FCA or PRA initiatives, and it's usually over a 20 month, 24 month period. And it usually includes predicted implications for financial sector and, and proposed timelines and key milestones for implementations of new changes. And since our last session in January, we've been treated with two versions of the grid. Just after our session, we had the February grid published and then unusually we've had a summer update and this was published following FISMA 23 receiving Royal Assent. The summer um, update, it kind of touches upon the steps that regulators are now able to take, which are reflecting the new obligations and accountability mechanisms that was introduced by FISMA. 23. Um, and to get into the detail of the changes since publication of the February initiatives grid, I'm going to pass it over to Jamie and he's going to kick us off. Thanks, Caroline. Morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, this is the, uh, we're, I think we're going to turn on to it, the Financial Services and Markets Act 2023. And that's the core piece of legislation underpinning today's session. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on it, but um, some of the initiatives that we cover over the coming slides derive from or are incorporated within this too. So it's it's useful just to get a, a handle on what the what the key components are. And it's been called many things. It's a landmark. It's a significant milestone. It's a once in a generation reform to the UK financial services sector. So obviously it's got us really excited. And um, so so what is it? It uh, was first introduced in the 2022 Mansion House speech, uh, and it received royal assent on the 29th of June, 2023. So not that long ago, um, but it has repercussions uh, down the line. And that's when um, some, some of the key uh, enabling initiatives will, will really start to bite. And it is truly transform transformative. Um, Caroline's gonna come on to the, the impact on EU regulations next, but 
um, it, it does have wider implications and it covers a, a, a diverse uh, range of topics. It's over 350 pages long. Uh, the explanatory notes alone are an additional 278 pages. Um, so needless to say, we can't cover it in a great deal of depth today, um, but we will be going over the, the, the core components. And it's the product of the future regulatory framework review um, that we've covered in a previous session. Um, that was in 2021-22. And that was a deep dive into how we adapt the UK's domestic uh, financial services framework post-Brexit. So in a nutshell, it's aimed at tailoring financial services regulation to UK markets as the UK adapts to its position outside of the EU. And it sets out the framework for repealing retained EU law uh, on the topic of financial services, as well as other key modernization outcomes. So some of the key um, FRF review outcomes that were included in the Act uh, are setting out a comprehensive FISMA style, FISMA 2000, the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000 approach to UK regulation, where you've got regulated activities and you've got specified investments. Um, the, you know, the, the, the same kinds of prohibitions, um, but in a more sophisticated way and that's more modernized. Enhancing uh, the objectives of the regulators, the FCA and the PRA for sustainable growth and international competitiveness, bolstering accountability of the regulators to the parliament and um, introducing a designated activities regime known as the DAR to allow activities related to financial markets to be regulated within the framework, which is compatible with the FISMA model. Um, it, and, and, and the reason behind that is because uh, the, the fact is that some of those activities, products or, or conduct considerations are currently regulated by retained EU law rather than by FISMA. So it's really amalgamating them into one area. Um, in terms of the Edinburgh reforms, we covered that in a previous session. Um, they were, they came to the fore in December 2022, and they also play a key role in the Act. Um, we've got things like uh, a review of SMCR to foster the UK's growth and competitiveness, um, reviewing the, the the banking ring fencing regime, payment accounts regulations, and more, uh, and also consultations around the central bank digital currency and the Consumer Credit Act reform. And in terms of rejected amendments during the bill stages, there were various of these, and you know, perhaps tellingly, some of them re were rejected. The House of Lords pushed for uh, considerations regarding the natural environment, and that was rejected on the basis that it was too broad and open to interpretation, which is, um, you know, it's quite a sensitive topic in today's political environment, um, and and it, it, it's sensitive and and important, of course. Uh, and and we also have an amendment that uh, would have required the FCA to consider financial inclusion in respect of consumer protection objectives. That was rejected due to concerns about short notice and uh, the absence of proper consultation. And the Lords also pushed for incorporating an artificial intelligence amendment such that any business should have a designated AI officer responsible for the safe, ethical, unbiased and non-discriminatory use of AI. And despite not accepting that amendment, the government has been very vocal as it would be in, in recognizing AI's potential in revolutionizing all sectors, including financial services. And we're expecting a feedback statement on how regulation can support the safe and responsible adoption of AI in financial services by the end of this year. Um, so that particular question hasn't gone away, but it's just interesting that it wasn't um, built into the framework as, as other provisions have been. Um, so in terms of key provisions, we're gonna cover some of these in more detail, but just to give you a flavor, we, we, we touched on reforming the regulatory framework and Caroline's gonna cover that next. Strengthening accountability for regulators with this new secondary objective around growth and international competitiveness. The act has emphasized accountability of the regulators and enhancing that. Uh, to ensure regular reporting and a greater focus on uh, cost benefit analysis. Uh, there's also a mutual recognition framework. That's another one. The Act is facilitating um, the Treasury in adjusting our domestic legislation for the smooth implementation of mutual recognition arrangements related to financial services internationally. 
And there are some other initiatives that were covered in the February 2023 grid. Um, again, some of these will come on to again shortly. APP scan prevention measures, FCA rules and access to cash, oversight of the financial promotions gateway, and many more. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's really a, a diverse batch. Um, as to timing, key sections of the Act were activated on the 29th of June. Uh, so exam examples of those are the Financial Promotion Gateway and the Mutual Recognition Framework, and then other provisions came alive on the 29th of August. But as I've said, um, that's that sort of scene setting and enabling initiatives to, to, to come into effect later on. And we'll, we'll take, into a deeper uh, take a deeper dive into those issues uh, next. I'll hand you back over to Caroline. Thanks, Jamie. As you can see, we've um, for this session, we've adopted a very much a tennis match style of presenting where we we're going to pass back and forth as to try and avoid you being too bored with the dulcet tones of one person for too long. Anyway, um, in previous sessions, we've already covered the basics around the future re um, regulatory framework and the rather disappointingly, I would say, the um, summer update to the regulatory initiatives grid didn't really add too much. It did um, it sort of introduce this new uh, acronym, um, which we love an, an acronym in uh, in financial services world, but REUL, which is, is effectively the retained EU law. And so the, the summer update really only um, clarifies that FISMA 23 will provide the framework to repeal the retained EU law relating to financial services post-Brexit. And last time we did cover off some of the detail of the proposed changes as part of the, um, um, the future framework. And uh, such as sort of solvency too, we went into in a fair bit of detail and the changes around that. And, and those um, those sort of future framework changes are already kicked off. And the summer publication of the grid notes that we should um, expect an update on the proposals from those projects that have kickstarted already in the Q4 version of the grid. So I think the the next iteration of the regulatory initiatives grid will be a much better read where it comes to the FRF. Um, they also are a bit flaky in the July grid in that they kind of talk about the fact that they're still trying to work out the best way to publicise and implement the required changes. And I think there's been talk about all of the changes of the FRF being published within one document that stands alongside other FCA publications, but they're still not clear how that's going to gonna progress. So I guess on this one, it's a, a watch and a wait and see what happens and, and sort of look forward to the Q4 version of the grid, where hopefully we'll have some more um, detail to share with you. Pass back to Jamie. Gosh, that was quick. <laughs> uh, so yes, now we're on to authorised push payment um, scams or a APP fraud. And it's a familiar concept now for most of us, but essentially these occur when the victim so in this context, the payer in a transaction is induced by fraudulent means to authorize their bank to send a payment to a bank account controlled by a fraudster. And that's distinct from pool payment fraud, where the payments are extracted from the victim's bank account or debited to a card by a criminal without the victim's authority. So it's push payment. Um, and it can take a variety of forms. UK Finance has described eight different forms of APP fraud, but that's a non-exhaustive list. And one of these forms involves the criminal claiming to be a police officer or employee of the victim's bank. And the scam often begins with a phone call or a text message claiming that there's been a fraud on the victim's account and that the victim needs to transfer the money to a safe account to protect their funds. Um, there are other ways, of course, I'm sure we've all heard stories about Nigerian princes um, or the instances where in, in, invoices are intercepted and amended with fraudsters' own payment account details, which um, you know d does happen, and we've seen it in an advisory context too. Um, clearly, it's a prevalent issue and one that needs serious attention, since the existing framework under the payment services regulations doesn't always provide sufficient protection. And as to the status quo. The government agencies that are responsible for this area of banking services or payment services are the FCA and the payment systems regulator. And back in 2016, a complaint was made to the PSR um, about the, the lack of protection for consumers against harm caused by APP fraud 
and it was thought that the banks could be doing more to reduce the risk to consumers and um, perhaps they could be encouraged um, by making them liable to reimburse losses for such scams. Um, maybe that's the incentive they need. So uh, then we came to the contingent reimbursement model code in 2019, which is a voluntary code. And that allowed for uh, customers who are victims of scams to um, apply for reimbursement. But it's it's not universally adopted. There's a limited um, number of banks who've signed up to it. And those who do apply it, apply it to differing degrees. So that's what's led to this. Coming back to the new act, it provides for a mandatory reimbursement scheme. It amends uh, the existing payment services regulations to make sure that liability is imposed where a payment order is executed um, subsequent to fraud or dishonesty. And that's not something that had been explicit before. Um, and Importantly, uh, the payment orders are limited to those executed over a faster payment scheme. Um, it's also confined to protected users, so consumers, charities, and micro enterprises under the payment services regs. Um, larger businesses aren't included. Um, it's also not proposed that the regulatory obligations arising under the scheme would be directly enforceable by bank customers either, a bit like the consumer duty. Um, and the PSR has now launched two consultations in the lead up to the implementation of this new uh, requirement. And in June, it set out its final position on tackling APP fraud, um, or near final position, I should say. So the, the key takeaways from that are, um, firstly, that the initial proposal for a £100 minimum threshold for claims has been rejected. So there's no de minimis threshold. There will be an upper limit to the scheme. But PSPs can, if they wish, voluntarily compensate victims beyond that. And the exact figure uh, will be up for discussion later this year. The payer's PSP is now obligated to reimburse the victim within five business days. Um, and that is protracted since the initial proposal of 48 hours. There's also a stop the clock provision, uh, giving some flexibility, particularly when gathering more information that is often needed in these situations where it can be um, difficult to pin down the, the cause. Um, as for the exception on gross negligence and reimbursement, um, based on feedback, the PSR will offer more clarity and guidance on that. And there's an advisory group in place to support as well. And finally, implementation will follow two routes, a requirement for Pay UK to establish scheme rules and a general direction to all PSPs to comply with the rules. So in terms of next steps, we've got the new reimbursement requirement coming into force in 2024. By the end of this year, the PSR will publish the claim excess and maximum level of reimbursement, so the upper limit, and additional guidance on the consumer standard of caution, that's the gross negligence standard. Um, it's also going to publish um, legal instruments concerning that. And in October, so next month, the PSR is planning to consult on the draft general direction, which will be given to all payment firms uh, on the topic of, of reimbursement. So I'll hand you back to Caroline. Thanks, Jamie. And I'm going to put you on the spot, Jamie. I'm going to ask you a question. How, you. What do you think the percentage of transactions in the UK are made in cash? What do you think the latest figure is? I, I reckon 85% of UK payments don't involve cash. <laughs> oh, yeah, Louise passed on the slide too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right, 15%. So 15% um, of tra transactions in the UK are currently made in, in cash. And, and despite this low number, the industry is continuing to see regulatory intervention in this to ensure that access to cash is maintained for those who need it. Um, and there's been so much good work in this space ongoing for ages for so many people, um, so many different um, organisations looking to ensure that those who need cash can access it. And, and alongside the other good work in this space, um, we saw in August um, the Bank of England, Treasury and the FCA all published policy statements on this topic. In terms of the, the Bank of England side of things, they effectively looked at the wholesale side of, of cash 
Um, and their update in August sets out how they will new, use the, the new powers under FISMA 23 to supervise wholesale cash distribution. And to do this, the proposals see the bank having some new or acquiring some new powers. Um, firstly, it's likely the bank will be put in place codes of practice around wholesale cash distribution, and that would, would, would require firms to comply with and would regulate the wholesale market cash distribution. Um, secondly, there is talk of the bank um, having some new powers along with the sort of that information gathering powers that you often see with regulators where they have the ability to go out to industry players and, and seek information, sort of audit the operations and then look at their compliance with codes. So that will give them much more penetrative powers to work out what's happening in the wholesale cash distribution market. Thirdly, um, the new proposal would include a power of direction, which, which again, it, it, it's just a bit more power in the bank to address emerging issues so that they can, they can require firms to act in a certain way if they don't think they are complying with the code entirely or if there's parts or gaps where they're, where they're missing out um, on, on, on that. Um, and lastly, the new proposal would also provide the Bank of England with enforcement powers. So where um, firms aren't complying with the new codes with respect to cash, wholesale cash distribution, the bank will be able to, um, to take action against them. So it'll be interesting to see how this evolves throughout the, the, the consultation period and, and work out what ultimately the bank is going to be able to do in respect of this. And not to be outdone by the Bank of England, the, on the very same day, in fact, the FCA and Treasury um, issued a joint statement. Again, they also had something to say on the matter. Theirs is much more consumer centric. So it's, it's kind of looking at the impact of, of con access to cash on, on end customers. Um, through this publication, it's, it's absolutely clear that the government wants to ensure there is reasonable provision of cash access services to the public. <clears throat> and through this um, note, they, they, they've tried to set out what they deem to be a reasonable provision and, and what that could mean. And they've clarified that in determining reasonable provision, they're, they're going to take into um, account many factors, including the types of cash services um, available and the, where the nearest alternatives are. Um, hours of availability, how, what time of the day, is there any gaps, when can people access cash? Uh, looking into sort of travel, geographical factors, also sort of infrastructure in terms of um, public transport. Um, demographic factors are also going to be considered, such as age and um, characteristics of vulnerability, which, which may reflect a greater need for cash access. And also, um, the potential for reliance on assistance when accessing cash that is provided in person. So that's the type of things that there, it's going to be considered as to determine whether or not a particular area or particular group have has got reasonable um, access to cash services. And from my view on this, I think what we can expect in the future is some new FCA rules being published, which will um, require firms to sort of fill those gaps. So where there is deemed to be a lack of reasonable access to cash services in a particular vicinity, we might see the FCA requiring firms to fill these gaps, such as the provision of um, free use ATMs, for example, uh, which is a common one. We, we might see more sort of directions like this where firms are are required to do something and we might see pooling of firms in particular areas trying to work together to sort of to, to address those gaps. I think it's also worth mentioning here that the FCA's powers under FISMA 23 will only apply to regulated firms in this space, so they will have no power to make any directions to retailers. So this means, in reality, it means actually that the FCA can't require retailers to actually accept cash payments. So it could be that many stores that we're seeing it more and more these days where, where, where certain um, stores or outlets are, are saying no cash, it's card payment only. So in future, we could very well get to a place where everybody can actually access cash. So you've got your cash, but you can't actually spend it because none of the retailers are accepting it. So it'll be interesting to see how this evolves. But I think it's a, it's a very important work stream because whilst um, people who do use cash payments seems to be in the minority, it's still a key 
lifeline for them. They need to be able to access and use that cash. So I think there's some good work to be done in this space. Over to Jamie. Better get it out from under the bed. <laughs> so yes, financial promotions gateway. Um, and we've got section 21 of FISMA there at the top. Many of you will be familiar with the concept of financial promotions, but you know, for those that aren't, it, uh, section 21 essentially restricts a person from communicating a financial promotion. That's an invitation or inducement to engage in investment activity or claims management activity, unless, so there's a restriction on doing that, unless you're authorized, an authorized firm uh, by the FCA or PRA under part 4A of FISMA, um, or the promotion's been approved by an authorized person, so a section 21 approver, or an exemption in the financial promotion order applies. So there's three ways of doing it. You're authorized, the content's been approved, uh, or there's an exemption that applies. And the focus of this one is, is, is on the, the process for having the content approved. And there's, there's, uh, the financial promotions regulatory framework is, is undergoing significant report, reform um, and central to that is the establishment of this gateway uh, that an authorized firm will need to pass through before it's able to approve the financial promotions of unauthorized firms. Previously, it just had to be authorized and that was sufficient in itself. But, um, and, and you would find um, that some firms uh, who were authorized for certain activities might consider approving financial promotions um, concerning activities that they didn't have authorization for. Um, and you know, but over time, that 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 waned because there were it, there was an increased focus on uh, risk systems and controls to prevent that from happening. Um, but now it's much more specific, and there's actually a, a, a formal gateway um, that will um, you know re restrict that to, to only those firms that are, are suitable and, and approved in the regulator's eyes uh, to do it. So the FCA consulted on the detail of the regulatory gateway and just a couple of days ago published a policy statement on this very topic. So it was written in the stars that we should cover it today. And the aim here is really to address the rising number of non-compliant promotions causing consumer harm and to tighten um, adherence to the, the general financial promotions requirements by unauthorized firms. And key points, the structure and application of the gateway, uh, essentially it's a requirement that will require um, all, all authorized firms, um, it will it, it'll apply on their permission, sorry, um, preventing them from approving promotions unless they're specifically permitted to do it. Um, and this means that unauthorized persons will only be able to communicate their own financial promotions if they've been approved by a firm that has had the requirement not to approve financial promotions varied or cancelled. Um, there is obviously the other way of doing it where they could rely on an exemption, but we're focused here on um, the approval route. So existing authorized firms will need to submit a variation of permission, a VOP application through Connect uh, to the FCA, and new firms will be able to request permission to approve unauthorized firms' financial promotions as part of their um, the process of, of obtaining authorization. There are some exclusions. Um, the following scenarios are exempted. You've got intra-group exemptions, um, promotions from unauthorized entities within the same corporate group are approved. Um, authorized firms giving their nod to their own promotions communicated by an, an unauthorized entity are also exempt from the gateway. And uh, principal firms in the context of um, appointed representative arrangements um, where they approve their appointed reps promotion um, they will be exempt, provided these are for regulated activities which the principal is accountable for. And it's, it's you know, be interesting to see how that interrelates with the specific exemption for appointed reps in the financial promotion order. Uh, so we've also got a transitional period, and um, there's first off, there's an application window between the 6th of November and the 6th of February next year. So November this year, February next. And within that window, all firms um, can continue their approval activities. Those that are keen to persist beyond in the new system must apply for the restriction to be removed. Uh, next, there's the transitional period. So during this time frame, authorized firms um, that have applied can go on approving 
and the FCA takes up to 12 months to assess the applications. Finally, under the new regime um, beyond, only those authorised firms that can rely on an exemption or have been approved um, can give the green light uh, to promotions from unauthorised entities. And in terms of timeline, as we've said, FISMA was activated on the 29th of June 23 this year. Um, the majority of gateway provisions kick in on the 7th of February 24. Um, but since 6th of September, the FCA has already had the authority to provide directions and guidance and formulate rules. And it's from the 6th of November to the 6th of Feb uh, when the FCA will begin accepting permissions applications uh, regarding financial promotions. So um, what to do now is ask yourself if you are approving financial promotions, whether there's really a, a commercial need given that additional um, uh, scrutiny. And I will hand you back to Caroline. Thanks. And on to fintech, <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite topics. I, I really love sort of following the new fintech companies that are popping up and it's great to see them popping up and lots of different um, areas and subsectors of 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 um of, of financial services sector and uh, this is a really exciting development if you're also interested in fintech um <clears throat> excuse me so um the as you probably know and uh, despite financial technology evolving globally the uk is still managing to hang on to its rank as, as one of the most fintech friendly countries globally and then we're particularly um lucky in edinburgh because we are so, we're kind of immersed in such a hub it's such a it's such a great place and it's such a great community for the evolution of fintechs and we're seeing more and more sort of global fintechs come over and make their boat base their home edinburgh in order to set that up and um, I don't think we're quite as busy as as the London market for that but it's great to see the UK as a whole benefiting from the fintech industry um, and so this next um, this next update is a really interesting so the financial market and um, infrastructure sandbox and um, this is another uh, another um, example of the treasury using its new powers under FISMA 23 to to create something new and so it's now it's consulted on the first ever financial market infrastructure sandbox in the UK that sounds like a bit of a mouthful but I'll hopefully explain what it is but effectively the sandbox is being set up um, in response to emerging digital assets that you'll you'll be familiar with them all but the types of things we're seeing are crypto exchange tokens um utility tokens or sort of asset back tokens and all of those new um digital assets need need new infrastructure in order to to support them and so the sandbox it, the kind of the basis of the sandbox is to enable digital securities to be tested and allow firms to set up and operate financial market infrastructures that utilize digital asset technology. Um, this sort of sandbox scenario will allow the market to perform loads of different activities in relation to the digital securities, but this will be done under a temporarily um, modified legislative and regulatory framework. So it's allowing and sort of forcing and, and supporting the evolution of the market infrastructure in order to be able to support these new digital assets going forward. And then effectively, once they've obviously found that this can work safely and securely then the potential in the future for that to be to be um to be pushed out and, and be mainstream um so as with all regulatory regulatory sandboxes it's, it's effectively a safe place to sort of try and test new technologies um and I think this is really cool because the launch of new digital assets really has the potential to be transformative for financial markets I think we could see in the future um, making it more efficient, transparent and resilient. But you can only do that if you maintain and preserve existing regulatory outcomes and the safety. And, 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 and I think that's why the UK has launched this. As a regulator, the FCA sandbox was the first um, of its kind globally and, and loads of other countries have now followed that sandbox model. And, I, and I, this is, again, it's just another step in the regulators and the government pioneering new um, initiatives in order to, to, to kind of lead the, the fintech sector and the evolution of these markets. So I'm really looking forward to the outcome of the consultation on this one. And it'll be really interesting to see the, the first entrance into the sandbox once it's launched. Jamie? Yeah, agreed. Yes, um, 
so among the changes brought in by FISMA 2023 um, was the introduction of uh, Section 415C, which mandates cooperation between the FCA, um, which, as we know, is the conduct regulator setting the rules um, and standards for financial firms. And it, I think it's got something like 51,000 financial services firms um, under its oversight. So you've got the FCA, the Financial Ombudsman Service, um, and the uh, Financial Services Compensation Scheme. And the Ombudsman Service is the alternative dispute resolution for financial services. Think of it as the mediator stepping in when there's been a dispute between consumers or small businesses and financial services firms. And then the FSCS is the safety net for consumers against financial losses when authorised firms can't cough up and meet claims against them. So this is a, a mandatory uh, cooperation um, set by FISMA 2023. So they've all got individual roles, but the reason for the cooperation, and you know, you'd be forgiven for assuming that they already would be cooperating. And I think that's the that's the point is that they are. It's just it hasn't been mandated and, and set up in a in a clear, modernised framework. Um, so they also have an interconnected nature. You might think that this is yet more bureaucracy, but the intention is positive because the idea is to you know address and collaborate on issues that significantly impact one another and and more broadly the wider financial services market. Um, so while each of them has their own distinct role, they are deeply intertwined. Um, and with without cooperation and dare I say coordination, um, you know, th this could lead to a fragmented approach and uncertainty in the market as to how to comply with things like the consumer duty. Um, so it is a statutory requirement. Um, and it, it, it's triggered when there are wider implications for each of the three bodies and the sector at large. This brings us on to the wider implications framework, and this isn't out of the blue. Um, since 2022, they have been cooperating under this voluntary framework, which is called the wider implications framework. And this new statutory requirement simply solidifies that and formalizes what's already been there in practice. Two weeks ago, the FCA published on its website um, that more details on the framework and confirms that it's how the bodies have chosen to comply with this new obligation. And there are two other members of the framework who aren't subject to the duty, um, but are members of the framework, being the, the pensions regulator, TPR, and the money and pension service, and the FCA chairs it. So examples of, of when it's been used are the British Steel Pension Scheme consumer redress scheme uh, and also consumer duty much has been made of um, whether the the FOS and the FCA will will be aligned on on implementing and interpreting the consumer duty as we all know um, lots of it is is um, still to be um, our interpretations are still to be refined on some topics and and how, how these bodies decide on them will you know impact how we interpret them um, so the framework provides structure to what that coordination will look like. And given the FCA has been pretty vocal about its focus on the consumer duty and enforcement activity in particular, it may not be long uh, before we find out. Over to you, Caroline. Thanks. And uh, I think that that sort of uh, segues nicely into this one. Um, Jamie mentioned the FSCS there, which is obviously the, the last port of call where uh, if, for example, in, uh, someone has gone gone into insolvency and, and is unable to pay redress for example to a customer the, the FSCS can step in whereas um this next initiative is um trying to avoid that to try and uh, stop um, and kind of intervene in insolvency proceedings for insurance sector and I think um this is this is all done with a view to maintaining public confidence in the insurance sector. So the government is consulting on a range of measures which would amend the insolvency arrangements for insurers. And if you've never been involved or affected when an insurer enters insolvency proceedings, uh, you're missing out. It's a real treat. I can, it's a very interesting process and, and there's a lot to consider. Um, and so this is trying to avoid those uh, fun times. Um, and the proposals in the consultation, it sets out a number or a series of targeted amendments to the current insurer insolvency arrangements. Um, and 
one of the most important changes is the clarification of the court's existing powers under section 377 of FISMA. And that's not FISMA 23, it's the existing FISMA. I think it's maybe the first time I've referenced that so far today. Um, but under section 377 of FISMA, um, the court, uh, there's a court process which uh, allows the court to order a reduction of the value of an insurer's contracts. And this is known in the insurance industry as a write down. <clears throat> the new proposals changes this up slightly and it sees a two part test needing to be met um, in order to invoke the write down process. The first element under this is that the insurer is or is likely to become unable to pay its debts. And the second is that the write down would be reasonably likely to lead to a better outcome for the insurer's policyholders and other creditors as a whole. So it's looking kind of holistically at the full suite of creditors and policyholders and will only allow the write down process to take place if it's, act it's seen as the best outcome overall. And where the test is met, then the process would see the, the court um, process kicking off. Um, the, the pro part, as part of the process, the PRA would then appoint an approved write-down manager. And the write-down manager will have lots of different responsibilities throughout the process. For example, they um, will be given the right to sort of direct um, the outcome. So it might be things like they can defer liabilities or the write down manager might have the ability to place a moratorium on legal process being taken against the firm, including the enforcement of security. And it's all about that sort of breathing space and allowing time to, to get their get, get their, um, their their business in order. Um, there's some other proposed changes in the consultation, and this would include the introduction of um, new provisions to help mitigate business disruption and um, losses for insurers in distress. And there's um, kind of connected to what Jamie just mentioned, there's going to be uh, there's some chat around changing the protection that's provided by FSCS in the event of a write down under Section 377 of FISMA. So there's a there's a whole lot of different initiatives that they're looking to sort of streamline this process. But the most importantly, the changes are really to make sure that um, both policyholders and creditors are sort of getting a fair deal out of insurers where they face financial distress. So it will be interesting to see the outcome of the consultation to see what changes will be implemented in, in this regard. Jamie. Thank you. So another initiative to, to help, you know, similarly to help the function, that the, the, the market keep functioning, the function. I like the function. <laughs> <laughs> another acronym, perhaps, <laughs> is uh, the market study for work on wholesale data. So what's it all about? Well, when we talk about wholesale markets, and often in the past I've um, been known, I'm sure, to sort of just assume I know what it means, but it's, it's useful to be um, more specific. What we're really talking about is markets that enable companies, public sector organizations, governments and financial institutions to raise capital, to fund growth, undertake domestic and international trade, manage financial and other risks and pursue investment opportunities. So it's distinct from retail, obviously, but th those are the, the types of markets we're talking about. And the effective functioning of wholesale financial markets relies on data. And the data is used by stakeholders for numerous things uh, that make it all work, such as investment decisions, evaluating firms' financial standings, and meeting um, regulatory obligations as well. You get reg data. And proper data functioning is crucial for those informed decisions, and it's essential for um, economic growth in the UK's um, global standing. So this market study was initiated uh, on the 2nd of March and focuses on benchmarks, credit ratings data and market data vendor services. And it was initiated in response to concerns around the efficiency of wholesale data markets. So if the data is not working, then it becomes inefficient and it falls under a larger scope of work related to wholesale data, which includes the trade data review. There's also some consideration around a consolidated tape provider for various asset data and um, providing a continuous stream of market data. Um, and the study focuses on six key themes, uh, which some of you will recognize have, have a bit of a competition focus. So barriers for entry and expansion, network effects, vertical integration, suppliers, commercial practices, 
behavior of data users and incentives for innovation. And in terms of progress, uh, there's been 28 responses from a diverse set of stakeholders. Uh, regulators from other countries have also raised similar concerns around non-transparent pricing, excessive charges, bundling and licensing deals. And preliminary findings have suggested that there might be features in each market that affect competition, but the FCA has opted not to refer any market for further investigation to the CMA at this stage. Some of the emerging issues by segment um, for benchmarks, there are three major providers who dominate the UK's benchmark revenues. Markets are concentrated with limited user switching. Some administrators might have practices resulting in higher costs for users, that's benchmarks. With credit ratings data, um, we know the big three CRAs, that's Moody's, S&P Global Ratings and Fitch Ratings. They dominate revenues for, from uh, UK credit ratings activities. And there's been concerns over transparency of credit ratings data pricing. Uh, for market data vendor services, um, Bloomberg is the dominant player with um, few major entrants in, in, in recent years. And despite sophisticated buyers, many feel they have minimal bargaining power with large vendors. So, so they're the sorts of focus, focuses that are emerging and could well lead to steps being taken in the future. Um, feedback has been invited and the deadline for that is the 29th of September. Uh, there's an extended analysis being performed on the collected data and a market study report detailing findings and decisions is going to be published by March, uh, 1st of March next year. And um, we'll know more about what the uh, you know, rule changes or firm specific remedies will be uh, once that report has been published. Back to Caroline. Thanks. Jamie, um, I can't believe we've only got 13 minutes left, so I'm going to try and rush through the last topics I'm going to that I'm due to talk on. But the first one is about um, about the kind of the advice boundary, and, and we find that often firms, and particularly the the frontline staff who kind of speak into customers, sometimes there's a fear of falling on the wrong side of the advice boundary. Effectively, firms don't want to be seen to inadvertently give in personal recommendation or financial advice. So, knowing that this is a, this is a bit of an issue, the FC has clarified how it in Treasury are planning to carry out a review on the boundary between advice and guidance for customers. Um, that was, you might remember that this, this um, review was announced as part of the Edinburgh reforms. And as usual, we've had a bit of radio silence until now where we, we, we've, we've got this um, publication note and that they are going to do the review. Um, and the, the review, it will plan and it'll kind of build on what's already been implemented with the consumer duty. And it's all about ensuring that consumers get get the, what they want at the time that they need it and um, to help them make informed financial decisions. It's just building on support and, and information. Um, and hopefully there's no timelines for this yet. So we can't, we're not sure when to expect the, the, the outcome of the review, but hopefully while the review is ongoing, the FCA has published some clarification guidance for firms who want to support customers more, particularly given um, the cost of living crisis. And then this guidance will show them what they can do without providing a personal recommendation. Um, and and it's it's actually quite practical and quite useful, and I think it'll be good for this information to be disseminated to call centre staff or other frontline um, workers within your firms who who's having conversation. And it really shows them where sort of clear examples of where a conversation with a customer would not be classed as a personal recommendation and coming down on the side of the advice boundary. Um, and examples of this would be kind of just being factual, explaining the factual difference between two products types to a customer customer or directing them to a budgeting tool, that type of activity won't be deemed to be financial advice. It's, it's deemed to be support. And I think this will be welcome guidance for, for those firms where they do struggle to, to sort of understand the difference. So I think there's lots of really interesting um, information in that update. So it's worth taking a look on the FCA's website to find it. Jamie. Yeah. Um... So we're on to the Bank of England's system-wide exploratory scenario exercise, or SWES, as we like to call it. Um, it's actually more interesting than it sounds. Uh, this, this was introduced <laughs> to analyze and understanding 
uh, and understand the behaviors of banks and non-bank financial institutions in times of stressed financial uh, conditions. So it's a scenario, it's like scenario exercise. And the aim is to understand how uh, the beh behaviors could potentially magnify shocks in financial markets. And a key goal is to bring data from different parts of the financial system to provide system-wide insights um, based on how they respond to this, this test, um, with the idea being that that will better enable the bank and reg other regulators globally to, to predict vulnerabilities in the market um, and you know, be prepared to, to respond for them. And as recent global events have shown, you've had um, the, the dash for cash in March 2020 and guilt dynamics in September 2022, uh, all of which were you know, predictable in hindsight. But I, I think the idea is that this would allow them to be better predicted going forward. Um, participating firms, it isn't just a single se segment of the financial industry, it is uh, inclusive to reflect the wide range of institutions engaged in the financial sector in the UK, pulling in major banks, insurers, CCPs, um, and a variety of uh, funds, pension funds, hedge funds. Um, and the bank has actually published on its website on the 12th of July, the list of names of partic participating firms, I think some of some of which are are actually on the call today. So it really is, it, it's, a, it, it's a broad, diverse group and um, an interesting exercise to play, play a part of, or part in, I should say. Um, the results uh, will be expected in 2024 and they're gonna be on an aggregated basis um, and there will be conclusions about risks to the UK's financial stability. I think it's gonna be based on uh, two rounds of the stress scenario to consider system-wide interactions and amplification effects. Um, there will be three key transmission channels, liquidity needs, uh, response actions to those needs and additional actions to be taken. So uh, lo 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 lots to unpack there. Um, how useful it will be is you know, open to question because obviously simulated responses don't necessarily equate to real world dynamics, but it's commendable that you know, at least they're, they're they're going to have a go and, and, and see what the impact would be. Back to you, Kaz. Thanks. From one uh, acronym, SWES, to another ESG. And you'll be pleased to know, or maybe not pleased to know, because this is an area of real interest, I'm not going to spend too much time on ESG because we've got a separate event coming, um, coming up soon, which is dedicated to ESG. So you'll see from the slide here, I've just picked out two key developments that I wanted to mention. <clears throat> Firstly, Treasury has updated its green finance strategy, and that aims to reinforce and expand the UK's position as a world leader on green finance and investment by delivering five key objectives. Um, firstly, it looks to support the UK financial services growth and competitiveness. It also wants to encourage investment in the green economy and also to create a framework to promote financial stability. The fourth objective is to incorporate nature and climate adaptation into the government's green finance policy framework. And finally, it wants to align global financial flows with climate and nature objective. Basically, anything financial related, it's got such power to and such an it's got kind of such an potential impact on climate and nature that they, they really want to sort of align that as well. Um, I think it's definitely worth the read. It um it's really interesting to see how this is looking to evolve and, and the, the look at the strategy in detail. It is 132 pages, so I will warn you, it, it's quite a heavy read, but definitely uh, it should be of interest to you. Final point on the slide is just to mention that um, the FCA's sustainability disclosure requirements and investment labels policy statement has been delayed once more, and we're expecting it in Q4 2023. So I think the FCA has placed the SFDR into the um, the difficult pile internally and so who knows if we will have something by q4 but that's the aim jamie passing over to you because i'm conscious we're running out of time let's thanks go. <laughs> yes and uh, as caroline mentioned before all this uh you know isn't libor dead and it is to an extent um us dollar libor uh died a death on the 30th of june 2023 and that all stems from concerns around its accuracy and vulnerability to manipulation uh, following the financial crisis, um, but but since then, because it's so widely used, synthetic rates have been published, 
uh, for loans that can't easily be transitioned to new replacement rates. Uh, and the FCA has just, well, has, has confirmed um, its decision that uh, those synthetic rates for US dollar LIBOR one, three and six months uh, will um, end by September 2024, but they will require continued publication until then. Um, and most legacy contracts except clear derivatives can temporarily use synthetic US dollar LIBOR. Um, new usages are prohibited going forward. But there are other alternatives. We've got SOFA and uh, particularly for US dollar LIBOR. Uh, central bank rates are also conventional choice, fixed rates if you want to um, look for stability. Um, there are lots of options. It's not just about LIBOR, of course. Uh, so what's happening next? Um, Firms will need to brace themselves for the the the, uh, the end of September deadline of 2024, and contracts still tethered to US dollar LIBOR uh, will need to transition ASAP, and there could be negotiations involved in that. So, um, take care. Back to you, Caroline. I think we, we've we've um, created a new um, type of horizon scanning, system, <laughs> like speed speed horizon or something. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Um, this one is um, interesting. The changes to um, MCOBs, which it feels like historic now because it, it it was implemented with immediate effect at the end of June. But it's worth mentioning just in case you didn't notice it and you need to get these changes put in place in your processes. But back in June, the FCA published a policy statement which set out immediately effect of real changes for MCOBs and these changes basically allow borrowers to do a couple of things one to sort of reduce their capital repayments either to zero and to pay in interest only for up to six months and also to fully or partly reverse a term extension within six months of extending it and um, the critical part is that both of these changes can now be applied to a borrower's um, mortgage account without the need for them to complete an affordability assessment which is really great because it, it really helps sort of secure a degree of protection for consumers by allowing lenders to be a bit more flexible and so they can offer swifter temporary reductions in payments to help help customers um in times of difficulty um so yeah that's all i wanted to cover on that one jamie is, i think i'm going to pass back to you quickly for let's move on let's the next part now back to me on this right so <laughs> Changes to financial promotions regime for crypto. So we've, we've already covered the regulatory gateway. Um, we're now going to talk about marketing for crypto assets. And quick background, you know, traditionally crypto assets haven't been specified investments, so not subject to the financial promotion restriction. Um, this uh, 8th of June was a policy statement um, which outlined that there will be new rules for qualifying crypto assets, which are essentially crypto assets that aren't specified investments through other means, so that don't represent securities or derivatives um, or units in collective investment schemes, um, e-money. Um, so this would apply to exchange tokens like Bitcoin, um, but not things like NFTs. Uh, and the new rules come into effect from the 8th of October, so really not, not far away. There is some flexibility, however, uh, the FCA may, on application, grant additional time until the 8th of January uh, to, to comply with these rules. Um, and uh, th there'll be a, a 24 hour cooling off period, client appropriateness testing, client categorization. Um, the promotions themselves will have to be you know, similar to our current model for regulated firms, clear, fair and not misleading. Uh, prominent risk warnings are mandatory inappropriate incentives are prohibited. So refer a friend incentives no longer permitted. Um, and it will apply globally to firms, any firms targeting UK customers. It, the rules will have teeth. There are criminal offenses for getting it wrong, punishments uh, of unlimited fines, imprisonment up to two years, the usual uh, for um, getting financial promotions wrong. And there are alternative routes. Um, to, to promoting, it has to, as we covered earlier, authorised persons can do it um, or approve it. Um, crypto firms registered under the MLR, so not authorised but registered with the FCA, can do it too. Uh, and also there's the, the route of going down an exemption with the financial promotion order. Um, shall we move on to the next? Yeah, and I think we'll probably skip this one because everything is on there that needs to be said. We want to skip past consumer duty and then um, you might have missed these. These are our trusty um, quarterly updates. Jamie, do you want to mention something quickly? Because it's 10 o'clock, we've run out of time. 
there's i mean i think we've we've covered some of the salient ones there's you can peruse those at your leisure and if if you don't have access to the slides please do get in touch and we we can forward them on um but these cover the main ones from the current quarter going forwards until our next update um so let's keep rattling through those but we've we've picked out some of the relevant ones great Okay, <laughs> so uh, hopefully that was useful. It was, apologies, as always, it's a whistle-stop tour through a wide variety um, of information, some of which may be particularly relevant, uh, you know, others just, just of interest. But please do, you know, we encourage you to look into um, any of those aspects in more detail. And if we can be of any support, just get in touch. Have a great day. Thanks for coming along. As usual, the recording will be distributed. So feel free to distribute that widely within your organization. And lastly, thanks so much to Iono for helping pull this together and also for Louise um, for doing the slides and also a lot of the background uh, prep in terms of the slides. So hope you all have a great Thursday and we'll see you soon. Happy Thursday. Bye. <laughs>